Hey everybody, uh, thanks so much for joining us here for this webinar provided by the RFS and uh, how to develop a social media platform for your institution. Um, really happy that you could all join us and really happy to be joined here by Dr. Matt ha Hawkins as well from Emory University. Um, we hope to give you a lot of good information in this webinar, um, how to start up if you don't have a platform already or if you already do, maybe some tools that can help you run it more effectively. Um, but uh, this webinar will also be available at some point uh, on YouTube as well. If you just go to YouTube and you type in IR education, it'll show up under the RFS's um, webinar series there. So you can always access it at some point. And uh, I guess I'll just start. Um, again, I'll, my name is Rajat. I'm with the RFS Clinical Education Committee. And um, thinking about social media, if you think about it, there's really kind of two underlying goals there. There's a, there's a business component and there's an educational component as well. Um, a lot of the a lot of the content that we want to portray to you will be delivered by Dr. Hawkins here, but I kind of just want to spend about five minutes talking about the RFS and and this book here by the Mayo Clinic. Um, so if you think about the RFS, we are purely an educational um, we we purely have an educational goal when it comes to social media. We're not um, we're not. You know, at all. Hey, Rajat. Uh, Rajat. Hey. You probably need to share your screen. Okay. Let me see here. Hey. So, okay. So, I should be showing my screen now. Yeah. Sorry great. about that. Um, so, I'll, I'll start on this presentation here soon, but, uh, you know, just talking about the RFS, uh, we're there, we don't really have a business component to us. We're purely educational, and um, our underlying goal in kind of delivering, delivering this webinar to you is to uh, start to get you know the different IR departments out there to start developing a platform but once they do we want to kind of instill this sense of a community or society amongst all of us and kind of work together to help promote one another and um, I'm sure Dr. Hawkins will talk a little bit more about that but you know any posts that you guys come up with we'll definitely be keeping an eye out for and definitely be trying to repost any hashtags that you're that you're able to come up and develop uh, you know, we'll definitely keep an eye on that as well and uh, use them in the future and promote you. And our hope is as a society that the different platforms that develop at the different institutions out there will help promote us as well because we already do have a running Twitter account. Um, it's kind of under, it's kind of being revamped by right now, but once we do start developing posts, we'd like you guys to keep an eye out for that as well and, and help promote us as we're, as we will try to promote you. Um, so, I met Dr. Hawkins at SIR last year, and he gave a great talk on social media. And when I went back to my research institution, um, I looked up one of the books that he had mentioned in his talk, and the book is actually this one right here. It's called Bringing the Social Media Revolution to Healthcare. It's developed by the Mayo Clinic Center for Social Media, and it has lots of great information. Um, so if it's really intuitive as well. So people kind of have this ambiguous standpoint when they're thinking about starting up a social media platform. They don't know how to do it. They don't know where to start. But it, it really just talks about things that are really intuitive. So the first part of the book is called Getting Inspired. You know, it talks about what social media is. It's about passion. It's about reaching out. It's about being a support, answering questions, getting answers, you know, storytelling, sharing, observing, learning, humility all these types of things and that it's not hard it's the, the trick is really just to get started and um, I know that's maybe a little bit easier said than done um, a lot of different uh, department I mean I would guess all of the different um, IR departments out there especially if you're associated with an academic institution you know have a bunch of red tape when it comes to promoting yourself online and these types of thing and there's a public relations department so it's important to figure out that step first and foremost. So what I did was I went to the main radiology administrator. I told them I was interested, you know, and they said, yeah, we'd love to set up an account for you on Twitter, on Instagram, and these types of things. But, you know, there's a public relations department. And you have to go through them, and you have to fill out a formal proposal. And um, it wasn't really hard to do at all. They kind of just wanted to know what our goals were and how we're going to, um, you know, put them across and, and how we're going to um, use these tools that they're going to give us access to. And then they, and it says the greatest challenge is finding your community. But then once you, I think what, what you'll realize once you get started is that there's already a lot of IRs out there and a lot, a lot of different IR departments out there that are on social media. And once you just do a little bit of searching and see who's uh, posting about IR and who's following who, 
uh, I think you'll find your really e it'll be really easy to find your business community at that point. Once you start following people, they'll follow you back. And then you know, finding your patient population community isn't that difficult as um, as well. It's it's basically just posting about you know different diseases, different things that the savvy patient uh, population community um, will be looking up and researching, and then they'll be able to see that you're posting about them. Um, but then again, it's it's not an immediate process. It's going to take some time. Um, but then that's what they say the greatest challenge is. Um, you know, and then it's, uh, it starts saying, uh, the next chapter says, social media starts with people. They mention this author, Clay Shirky. He writes this book, Cognitive Serves Plus. He says, think of social media like electricity. You know, nobody uses electricity for its own sake, just as nobody uses social media for social media's sake. They use it for quick bursts of information or entertainment to get answers to questions, to have a sense of uh, belonging to a community. And, you know, um, when you're posting, you want to think about these communities and what people you're trying to reach or going through and, and what would make le uh, life better for them. But um, that whole sense of community, one, one thing that I found out is, uh, you know, everybody in the department, it's not just the doctors who are following you, it's not just the patient population, it's, it's even your, the different staff and the, the, the ancillary staff, all the techs, the nurses, everybody's kind of involved in this community and um, it really helps you connect to one another. So the next uh, big chunk of the book is called Being Strategic, you know. Uh, this is uh, Lee Ace. She does social media for the Mayo Clinic. She has these seven thoughts, you know, start with business priorities and goals. Become personally familiar with the tool. Start by watching and listening. Ask for help. Pay attention to community norms. Don't be snowed by the purest. Plan and then that planning is more important than the plan. So I think first and foremost, just touching on this slide, I think it's a great way for medical students and early trainees to get exposure to the business aspect of IR if they try to take on this project for their department, um, you know, it, it puts you a part of a discussion that you would normally never be a part of. And uh, it really exposes you to the business discussion that takes place amongst these different departments. And, um, you know, it gives you an initiative to ask about these things so that you can be creative um, when, you're, when you're promoting them, when you're thinking about posting them. And, you know, uh, when you're starting out, just start by watching and listening. So what I did was I found out who the big um, IR social media people were out there and you know I saw different names like uh, Cincinnati uh, Children's Radiology and I saw Mount Sinai IR and I just kind of saw how they did it. I saw how they developed their content, if they kept on any sort of regular type of schedule and that really helped me um, figure out what I wanted to post about or talk with the different attendings in my department and, and see if we could post about similar things and that really got the whole content part of the process going for me. And, you know, don't be afraid to ask for help. Anybody out there, especially in the social media world, if they're already doing it, if they're already doing a great job, um, you know, just don't be afraid to send them a, a quick message and, and ask for a little bit of advice. And, you know, Dr. Hawkins will be talking up a, a little bit here, and I'm sure he'll be very amenable to be, um, to uh, you know, for you to ask him any questions after um, this presentation. Um, and, you know, pay attention to community norms. You know, really pick somebody who's going to run this platform that is, you know, that you, that you think is appropriate. So, you know, you, you're looking for someone who's, you know, kind of, so to say, not that guy. You know, you don't want, you want someone who's going to be wise, who's going to be humble, who's going to have great interpersonal skills. And um, when you're picking this person to run this platform, you know, it may require some reaching out, somebody who's not actively involved in your social media effort at the moment. Um, and that, you know, keep the planning horizon short. Uh, planning is more important than plans. You want to uh, so I tie this back to the electricity statement there. Um, you know, people are looking for short, you know, quick bursts of information or entertainment. They're not, you know, looking for something that um, that's, that requires uh, a, a, something to keep track of on a long-term basis. So you want to plan early. You want to plan often. And then you just want to repeat. So, you know, think about meeting once a month to uh, talk about your content and what you're going to go over. And um, plan early and plan often is very important. Um, so then we have Chris Boyer. He he wrote the next part of the the next chapter there. He does social media for um, Innova Fairfax uh, Healthcare System in Virginia, and he you know he just says you get started and get these are all intuitive things here. Get started and get familiar. Think about how these tools can be used for business. Create something worth following. Build a network of peers. Uh, align efforts with business strategies. Measure what you're doing, and you know share um, successes and learn from your failures because. More often than not, you're going to have uh, what you uh, term as a failure with your posts and stuff. They might not be as popular or they might not gain as much attention as, as you want, but, you know, don't consider that a failure. Just keep on going. Keep on posting is, is the key there. Um, you know, and measure what you're doing. 
is it's tough because there aren't really a lot of advanced metrics out there for social media and seeing how these contribute to ROIs and such. But um, it's important to keep a track of uh, what you're posting and who's responded to it and how you've responded back to them. And uh, I think at some point down the line, these advanced metrics will be available. Um, but I'm sure Dr. Hawkins can talk a little bit more about that. And then uh, kind of the last thing here I want to talk about is you always have to keep privacy in mind. This is a very big component. Um, so, you know, you have HIPAA. We all know what HIPAA is. And then you have this thing called high tech, which is the uh, health information technology for economic and clinical health act. It's basically the online version of HIPAA. So it helps protect patient information the same way as, uh, you know, the HIPAA would on paper or within the hospital. So just remember that privacy discussions have to be embedded at the point of ideation and design. This is something that you want to include in your proposal. That you want to make sure that you tell your public relations uh, department that you are keeping an eye on this, is, that this is a very um, important thing for you to, to track along the way. And um, you know, pro uh, providing a guide for anyone who will be engaging with you is, is maybe important. So just include the basic rules of engagement you know, on Twitter or something, if or on your Instagram, you can just put a little blurb there that, um, you know, what the basic rules of engagement are. And, um, you know, you don't have to tolerate defamation or unlawful material, but you do need to be willing to live with some sort of a valid criticism. I think that's the name of the game here. A lot of people will uh, validly criticize you, and you have to just com communicate and learn to attempt to make the situation better as opposed to lashing out or, um, you know, uh, losing followers based on your responses. And um, so, yeah, you, you learn to live with the dialogue and um, intellectual privacy is kind of the last thing I want to say here is um, one thing that I've uh, learned along the way is, you know, in a lot of these posts, the people covet them. You know, they're happy and they're proud of their posts. So just make sure that you're giving due credit along the way when you do repost things or when you do hashtag things that you, um, you, met, you mentioned the source or whoever was involved in that helps, uh, you know, gain a mutual following as well. When people see that you're posting about them or reposting things that they've posted, just make sure to give them credit because then, um, you know, they'll follow you back and then you may gain followers that they have already uh, gained themselves. And then, you know, I've included this uh, presentation as a handout here. So I, I think if you go to the handout portion, you can um, download it. But, you know, this is basically uh, the, the next few slides here are all um, things that you can use when you start having the, the first discussion about setting up the platforms and uh, the discussion with your, the heads of your department about what, you're, what the needs are, what you're going to be talking about, what you're going to be posting about, how you're going to be doing it. So if you want to go ahead and, and download this here, this is straight from the, the Mayo Clinic book and it will help uh, you develop a framework and um, when you're submitting that proposal to whoever you're submitting it to in your, in your hospital, uh, this is a, just a great checklist to follow along with, you know, has, make sure you have your executive summary background. Um, they may give you their own format that you want to follow, but if you go ahead and make this for yourself, not only will you have it on record, but it'll be easier for you to submit to them uh, based off of their own um, outline. So uh, what I'm going to do now is um, I'm just going to hand it off here to Dr. Hawkins. Dr. Hawkins is joining us from uh, Emory University. He's a board certified radiologist and assistant professor there at the School of Medicine. Um, he specializes in pediatric interventional radiology, including the vet treatment of vascular malformations, uh, liver transplant interventions, varicoceles, uh, venous thrombolysis. Uh, his non-clinical interests, which make him a great um, person for this talk, if not the best in our world, is uh, health policy, informatics, quality improvement, social media, and specifically targeting healthcare challenges where these disciplines intersect. Um, so we're really happy to have him here. He serves on a number of different communities, uh, um, committees, not only for the SIR, but for the ACR as well, and uh, the RSNA. And um, I just want to hand it off to him and say, Dr. Hawkins, thanks so much for being here with us. And um, I'll let you take over here. All right. Well, thank you, Rajat. Uh, can you hear me OK right now? Is my screen up? Is everything working yeah. the way it's supposed to? OK. Yep, it is. All right. Well, well. Thanks everybody for joining us uh, on a on a Sunday evening. Um, you know, first of all, I have to congratulate you guys on this um, series that you guys have put together. Um, I've uh, seen the SIR RFS go from not being in existence to you know what it is today. So, congratulations to you guys. 
Uh, a little background on my training before we get too far into this. Uh, so I, I have actually two fellowships. I did a pediatric radiology fellowship at uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital. And during that time is where um, my quest, if you will, into social media kind of started. And we'll talk a lot about that today. Uh, and then I uh, did my vascular interventional training at the University of Washington in Seattle. So. Uh, subsequently now I do pediatric interventional radiology but uh, speak quite a bit on social media uh, and it's nice to talk to a group like this usually at the beginning of these presentations I have to spend a lot of time convincing people that social media is a real thing uh, and, and something uh, that involves more than uh, tweeting about you know the the, the latest Shakira concert or uh, the latest NFL football game and that there is actually good material on there and, and can be a helpful tool for building your practice. I can kind of get over. Uh, I don't have to spend a lot of time on that today with you guys. Um, but Rajat touched on a lot of this, uh, a lot of the reasons why social media is a valuable resource and something that we have to be invested in. And usually, the, for people that are doubters, the the, the first place I'll start uh, is the fact that patients will Google you. I'm in a particularly sensitive spot uh, because I'm a pediatric interventional radiologist, so. My patients' parents are my age. I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. And so the people I'm dealing with on a daily basis are often in their 20s, 30s, and 40s because it's the, par the patient's parents uh, that are dealing with this. Uh, and if you don't think they Google you, you're mistaken. Uh, I, nearly every clinic patient I ever see knows everything about me uh, before I met them, and that's something important to keep in mind. Uh, why does social media matter? Uh, you know, we're going to spend most of the time talking about from a department standpoint, but from an individual standpoint, yeah, if you Google Matt Hawkins MD, um, this is what comes up, and, and you'll see a few different things on on the first page of, of Google. And obviously, I have my Emory, uh, I have my Emory page and the Children's Healthcare of Atlanta page, but you'll also see a lot of my social media accounts. So you know, my LinkedIn account shows up on page one, my Twitter account shows up on page one. Uh, Doximity, obviously, uh, Doximity. Uh, the search engines and the search bots, they love Doximity now because it's tied into U.S. News and World Report. I don't know if you guys were aware of that. So if you don't have a Doximity account, it's something worth having just so that you know that it's going to turn up on page one. Uh, the only the only person that wasn't me that showed up when you searched Matt Hawkins, MD, uh, was this Matthew T. Hawkins, Jr. I think he was a, a sports medicine physician from California. But otherwise, when if patients were to Google me, uh, they're going to find information that I have been able to curate, uh, that I have more control of. Uh, and the other thing you'll notice is there are no vitals or health grades pages here on page one. So an important reason for us individually, as well as as a group, you know, when you're building a practice, to have a social media presence. Uh, further evidence, if you don't think the patients will Google you and then reach out to you, this is, uh, this is from this past year. Uh, I'll tell you, that was, this was my first, the first patient that reached out to me directly on social media. Um, via Twitter, that was in December. I've had a number since then uh, similar. So patients are absolutely going to seek you out and then they will contact you directly through social media. One of the biggest reasons, I, I think part of the reason, you know, Rajat probably has brought up this topic as something important for you guys in the RFS uh, to really engage in social media for is the concept of curating content. Between the Mayo Clinic and WebMD, um, Patients don't really need us for information. They can find information. What they really want is our opinion of that information. Uh, and, and proof of that is in the American Medical News here not that long ago, a survey showed that 85% of adults are on the internet, 72% of adults search for health information. I think that number is probably fairly low. 24% um, of adults now are posting about their health. Again, that was in 2013. I, I'm sure that that number has gone up in the past couple of years. I, it seems like I can't pull up Facebook without seeing somebody posting about whether you know their lymphoma that they're battling or breast cancer or uh, something about their child's illness. So people continue to post about their health and the privacy concerns that um, were so uh, central to HIPAA being passed uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s don't seem to be as applicable perhaps to our generation. Uh, lastly, and, and strikingly, uh, over a quarter of, of U.S. adults post reviews about their medical experiences. You probably heard a lot about Yelp trying to get into uh, the medical review business, uh, and that is certainly happening. So again, another reason to make sure you're engaging with patients in a way that they 
want you to engage with them, which isn't necessarily just posting information, it's posting your opinion about that information. Um, the last and important thing to really realize about how social media is changing the way people communicate with all this pervasiveness of information, the unlimited avail availability to share knowledge, all of that is embedded in a network where your peers trust other peer recommendations more than ever before and seek them out before engaging with a product or an entity. And by peer, that doesn't mean an old school friend. That just means, for me, another mid-30s young professional. If I hear from them that they liked a particular physician, uh, or liked a particular car dealership, or liked a particular restaurant, I am more likely uh, to engage with that product uh, than if I do not have that peer review. And there's no better evidence for that uh, than Amazon. Uh, the amount of time that we spend looking at peer reviews on Amazon before deciding to purchase a product uh, it is really evidence to how things are changing in healthcare. Uh, the concept of how social media has changed all of this is really nicely described in a book called Pre-Commerce. Uh, if you haven't read it, it's called Pre-Commerce. It talks about how consumers spend tons of time studying and learning about a product and forming an opinion about a product before they actually buy it. This is uh, in contradistinction to the way people used to engage with products, which is where they went to a store, they bought a product, and then they decided whether or not they liked it, and then usually had very good brand loyalty thereafter. Um, so the key thing for us to realize is that now with social media and peer reviews uh, and, and peer engagement, uh, our patients have already formed an opinion about us before we meet them. So something that's very, very important for you as an individual interventional radiologist as well as for your practice to realize. Our patients aren't coming, we don't have a blank slate when our patients show up in our office. And so the opinion that they formed about us before they get there uh, in many ways can be controlled by our social media presence. So something very important for everyone to keep in mind uh, as, as you begin building a social media program uh, on whatever platform you so decide. The other important thing, to, another reason to be on social media is it's becoming a, a huge resource. You know, obviously the encyclopedia died years ago. Uh, people are still using Google, but now YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world and quickly catching up with Google. Um, now people with, with hashtagging and everything else, uh, you're starting to see people use Instagram and Twitter all for search uh, for material. Um, these social networks now, and pe patients are on these. P patients are, uh, per, uh, they are constructing content that can be searched. They're also searching for content. Patient advocacy groups are amazingly active on social media networks and are constantly seeking out information, not just the information, but also content experts. Health policy experts uh, often, um, they create a lot of content, but they also seek out information. So if you are working for CMS right now and you're trying to figure out how to develop some new alternative payment models or, or value-based incentives uh, for hospital payments for one of the diseases that we treat in interventional radiology, you better believe that some of the people that are doing research on this are looking on social networks to see who the leaders are in interventional radiology uh, and how our specialty is engaging with other specialties across the healthcare enterprise. How hashtags work, just a couple of examples of some of the more successful healthcare-centric hashtags. Obviously, there are many of these, um, but I provide a listing there. Uh, the most important one probably for this group to understand is breast cancer social media, just how ragingly successful breast cancer social media, or the BCSM hashtag, has become. Hugely successful, widely used across all of the social media platforms by patients, patient advocates, health policy experts, and everybody alike. Uh, the way that work, the way hashtags work, just in case people aren't familiar, uh, anytime you post in any social media platform uh, and you include that hashtag, this now becomes searchable. So even if someone doesn't necessarily follow you on Twitter, for example, but you tweet something out and include a hashtag in it, now all of a sudden you become findable by anyone that's interested in that topic, not just your followers, which is something very important uh, and really essential as you're building your social media presence. A couple of other hashtags that we absolutely need to know about. Uh, back in January of this year, about nine months ago, we officially developed a hashtag ontology. Uh, really the effort of the hashtag ontology is to organize radiology and interventional radiology centric content in a way that's going to be searchable years down the line. Um, the concern is if we really just 
if we don't make our content searchable in a meaningful way, you know, a lot of social media inter interactions just become these ephemeral blips on the radar that perhaps will have very little impact moving forward. Uh, but if our content becomes mineable, whether that's images, uh, whether that's uh, peer-reviewed journal articles, um, uh, if that becomes mineable, all of a sudden social media becomes a, a resource that ha almost has no limits. Now, uh, this is what it looks like. This is what the hashtag ontology looks like. And, and really the most important ones for us to keep in mind uh, are probably up at the top. You see the vascular interventional radiology, the IRED hashtag, and then IR onc. Uh, the interventional oncology hashtag. Also along the right hand side you'll see some of the disciplines, uh, health services, research, uh, leadership, uh, rad res uh, for issues that are pertinent to radiology trainees uh, and education. So as you are out there as an individual or as a department and a group posting, make your content searchable and hashtags now can be used on Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram and all the major social social media networks. So an important thing to keep in mind so that the content doesn't uh, just get lost into the uh, somewhere in the deep dark internet never to be found again. Uh, so you guys know we are being watched. Um, this is just a reality of social media. Uh, this is a company uh, called M Digital Life. I, I know the CEO and they're currently tracking, I think this number is up closer to 900 US radiologists now that are on Twitter. That includes interventional radiologists. Uh, they know how often we tweet uh, and they know where we're located. You can see the map and see the hotspots where radiologists currently tweet. Um, they track us at meetings. So this is, uh, this map shows every single physician to physician interaction um, at the RSNA 2014 meeting uh, last year in Chicago. And they know that we are physicians because our Twitter databases are linked to our NPI uh, numbers. So this is not something uh, these are all validated, verified, a lot of companies are following these and a lot of vendors and parts of industry are very interested in who's active, who's talking to who, uh, if patients are talking to physicians, if physicians are talking to patients, uh, etc. So realize we're being tracked but that's just part of it. Okay, now I want to get into the nitty gritty uh, of how we can actually implement a social media program or how can you so implement a program at your institution. And then I do want to talk a little bit how we measure return on investment because that's, it's becoming too important now to just say that doing social media is a good thing. Uh, we have to prove it. So first let's talk about how we can implement a social media program. And a lot of this stems from my experience at Cincinnati Children's where uh, I was heavily involved with the team that got their existing social media program off the ground. So if you just think simply about starting a social media program, I, I think if you look at it from a platform centric view. If you focus on Pinterest, if you focus on Twitter, if you focus on Instagram, uh, one, I think it's a little overwhelming because there are so many social media networks. Two, I'm not sure it does you much good because uh, frankly I think these all of these platforms are evolving so quickly. Uh, Twitter is hard, hardly what it looked like when it came out. You know, a few years back Facebook has obviously changed tremendously uh, most recently with the timeline view. Uh, from the old wall approach that it used to have, but they're changing so fast that having a platform centric approach probably will just bog you down. We haven't even hardly talked about YouTube. YouTube is another huge, huge social media platform that should really be part of the entire strategy, again, rather than focusing on a single, uh, a single platform. I want to highlight a few of the practices that I think do social media very well. Um, obviously, Cincinnati Children's at the top. Uh, Massachusetts General has an enormous social media program. We're going to talk more about them specifically when we talk about the return on investment. Uh, Charlotte Radiology is a private group. Again, all of these places have both diagnostic and interventional radiology uh, programs that they post about. And then UCSF uh, really has done a tremendous job from an educational standpoint, partic particularly from a radiation safety standpoint uh, of increasing radiologist presence on social media. Uh, as far as interventional radiology goes, I think probably Mount Sinai does it the best. Um, they're, they're the most, uh, uh, certainly have the most activity of the IR groups that I follow, although there are many um, that are active. Uh, and I always hate making lists like this because I always feel like I'm leaving someone out. <laughs> but first, the first thing we did at Cincinnati, we got together and we um, really thought about what we wanted to do. Um, I think one of the most dangerous things and the quickest way to fail in the world of social media is, you know, on a whim, some weekend a couple of people get together and say, hey, you know, we should start a blog. 
and everyone says, yeah, that sounds great. And they get together, they go home, someone gets a WordPress account, they write their initial blog, you know, they, they post their Hello World account, or their Hello World blog post, and then the blog sits idle for the next year and a half. And if there's the only thing worse than no social media presence is an inactive social media presence. Uh, so the underlying, the underlying message and everything I'm going to tell you here is it takes a lot of planning to make sure you can get this done right. This process that I'm going to describe to you took place over the course of about 8 to 12 months. This was not something that was done over a week or two week time period. So keep that in mind as you begin to develop your strategy. The first thing that we did as a group when we were deciding how we wanted to roll out social media was we had to have a purpose. What was the, what was the purpose? Was it just to make money, get more patients? What was the point? So at, at Cincinnati Children's, we actually came up with a mission statement, kind of cheesy, but it was very helpful to kind of focus our energy and our attention on what we wanted to accomplish with our social media efforts. Now, first of all was who, who did we want this, who did we want to reach, um, and what did we want to talk about? And obviously, we wanted to talk about pediatric radiology, and we truly wanted it to be open to all members of the public. You'll see some blogs that are very targeted at patients, some blogs that are very targeted at parents, some that are targeted purely for the physician and research communities. And we felt like limiting to one of those communities was going to be a disservice for the purpose of what we wanted to achieve. So we needed to make sure we had well-rounded content that could reach that audience. Um, we wanted to, we really wanted to increase our exposure worldwide. This is in contradistinction to perhaps a small private group or a small rural practice. Uh, you know, in rural Iowa, you have a very, that's a very different audience that you probably want to reach with a social media program. Or perhaps if you're a private practice in a busy urban area, there's maybe one city uh, that you want to target. So if you're targeting people in a particular city, maybe that means different social media platforms or different hashtags uh, uh, that you need to uh, include in some of your posts. And then finally, the topics that we wanted to post about, uh, we, we chose quality, safety, informatics, academics, you know, and patient care and the clinical care that we provided. So again, if your interventional radiology practice is getting ready to start a social media program, figure out what you want to post about. You know, are there a few diseases that your group is particularly adept at treating? Uh, are there some services that you offer that maybe have quicker recovery times than some of the more uh, mainstream alternatives? Think about those things before you just dive in uh, and hope for the best. The next thing we did, and probably probably one of the probably the best thing we did, is we developed a couple of committees to help us design the blog and the content. Uh, first of all, we developed a content committee, and that wasn't just a bunch of docs sitting around the table. It was a couple of physicians, but it also uh, was the technologist, it was some of our nurses, some of our administrators, uh, and some of our physicists to get together and try and figure out what was it, how, how are we going to create this content? Because there's no doubt that the hardest part about a social media strategy is developing content. Because if you're not active, people are not going to visit. People aren't going to pay attention to your Twitter feeds, people aren't going to visit your blog sites, people aren't going to visit your YouTube channel if you're inactive. Uh, the second thing we did was developed, excuse me, we developed a governance committee. We're going to talk about that more as well. Uh, the point of the governance committee was really to lay out some of the ground rules for how often we post, how do we deal with comments from patients, some challenging questions like that. And we wanted to decide what our structure was going to be like. Was this going to be an informal uh, blog or was this going to be a more uh, formal suit and tie interview, video interviews in, in a formal setting? We had to talk about those things before we started. So the content committee uh, kind of structured our blog posts, as you see here on, on the screen. Um, I tell people, you know, I'm, a, I'm an Indianapolis Colts fan. I'm from Indiana. Uh, there's a blog that I read every week, and they've got some, every, every day of the week, they've got some posts that I know are going to happen. So the Monday, the Monday after a game, uh, there's always a particular review on Tuesday. Uh, they tend to review the offense. Wednesday, they review the defense. And then the Thursday and Friday, they start previewing next next uh, next week's game. So we kind of wanted to set up something similar. So once per week, we did a how do we do it blog. So for example, how do we do MR interrography? Um, 
The second one is research. So our, we had a requirement for all of our faculty and fellows that if they presented at a national meeting or published, they had to do a short blog post, uh, either a text post or a short video about what their, uh, what their material was that they were presenting on. Uh, we, we did once per week on what makes us different or why do we do that. So for example, why do we, why do we have your child fast you know, the night before when we do a retroperitoneal ultrasound? Very helpful for patients to read the patients and their parents to read those things. Uh, once every two weeks, we did a profile on one of our team members, and then finally, the most powerful thing, of course, is uh, one every once every two weeks, we did a patient story, so a patient testimonial on their experience at Cincinnati Children's. Uh, the governance committee um, really was again set up to decide how we were going to answer some of those challenging questions of do we let patients post questions? How are we going to respond to those questions? How are we going to respond to criticism? What are we going to do if a patient posts patient sensitive material uh, in the comment section of a blog or replies to our to a Twitter post with that material? There's no, a, a lot of those answers need to be uh, informed by what the inst uh, policies are at the institution you're at or the hospital that you're working with. Um, and, and really there, there is no one single correct answer, but those are things you need to think about before they happen so you have a plan in place. And then lastly, as I mentioned, we, ha we thought in advance about the structure, the length of our text posts. Um, people are not going to read a 1,200 word blog post, uh, and so we aimed for 400 to 600 words. Same thing with a YouTube video. So often I see people post these 10, 12, 15 minute videos. I can't remember the last time I watched a video that long on YouTube. Uh, if it gets up over three minutes, people are going to turn it off and the message is going to be lost. And then finally, the interview format. I have a sample of one of the videos that we've made coming up here, and so you'll get to see the format that we decided on. Uh, Rajat touched briefly on some of the challenges to implementation of this social media program that we weren't really ready for. Uh, we reached out to the public relations uh, team and my marketing team well in advance to let them know what our intentions were, and, and initially they were quite supportive, I think, until they realized how serious we were. Uh, and we, we ran into a few obstacles. Um, Number one was blog design. Uh, they were very, very concerned about maintaining the, the, a similar look and feel to the hospital-wide brand. And of course, we had no problem with that, um, but they were very concerned about giving us control. Um, last, they were worried about us violating the enterprise message and maybe uh, saying things that weren't perfectly in line with what the hospital was saying on their hospital-wide blog. Uh, and so a battle over control, who was gonna control the content kind of ensued um, eventually, of course, came to a positive resolution, but took a while to get uh, over the hump, if you will. Um, this was this was a great lesson for me, uh, and something I wasn't entirely ready for. But we had to um, we had to compromise on some aspects. Uh, we didn't get exactly what we wanted with the design of the blog, uh, but we were able to maintain control of the content uh, by working closely with them. And I would encourage everyone to make sure you work through the marketing. Uh, and public relations teams at your hospital when you decide to roll something like this out. Um, once, when we had gone to the uh, marketing team there at Cincinnati Children's and told them about this, they then did a search of all of the other departments throughout the hospital, and there were actually nine other uh, sort of rogue blogs, if you will, that had been started by other uh, divisions or departments throughout the hospital that they had no idea uh, even existed. So while they were spending months being concerned about uh, perhaps us not maintaining a common look and feel with our blog design, uh, they discovered there was a lot of activity going on out there that uh, might be very difficult or impossible for them to track. So uh, regardless, the message is make sure you work with, with your public relations or marketing teams uh, as you roll this out. Uh, so to kind of summarize how you roll this out, uh, obviously, the goal is to create a sustainable and locally politically appropriate social media presence. Uh, I can't ex stress the sustainability enough. Creating content is hard. You have to have a plan for creating content. And I'll tell you, we uh, before we rolled out and went live with our social media presence, we produced a month's worth of content um, before going live. And that certainly saved us during some of those weeks where it's just it's hard to create a blog post or to make a video. Um, particularly uh, if you have limited resources. Uh, 
Number one, number two, the governance committee is vital. You have to have a governing body that's going to make some decisions on some of the difficult things that are going to arise with social media. Uh, number three on this list is daily social media management. I will tell you, uh, we did hire a 1.0 FTE uh, to manage social media at Cincinnati Children's, and this is a department with 34, 35 radiologists. Where I am right now, uh, we have in the ballpark of 110 radiologists, and that's going to probably require two to three FTEs to manage a social media program over a department that big. You cannot expect physicians to man maintain a daily social media presence uh, when they're required to manage the heavy clinical duties that they do these days. It will not happen, particularly in IR. So again, if you want this to be sustainable, work with leadership, have leadership buy-in, and make sure you have the resources needed uh, to successfully do this. Otherwise, you'll get it started I've seen this so often. They get started and they just don't last because the person who spearheaded it graduates on, changes departments. Um, perhaps it was a medical student or a resident or a motivated fellow uh, and, and they leave and the social media presence dies. So it's a very, that's one of the most important messages about the, this entire section on how to create a social media presence. And then lastly, manage the relationships with your local marketing team. It would be so important. Um, the last thing you want is to get a successful program off the ground is to have it shut down uh, by an angry marketing team. Uh, here's some of the here, here's what the result is now. This is this is what the blog, uh, the Cincinnati Children's Radiology blog looks like. Uh, certainly very proud of what we were able to accomplish. Um, we we've targeted four different social media platforms: YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And really, the purpose of those different platforms is to drive traffic to the blog. So whether we're posting our videos on YouTube. Uh, posting things on Twitter, pictures on Instagram. The whole point is to drive traffic to the blog. If you're if you're doing if you have an interventional radiology practice and you're treating a lot of uh, uterine fibroids or varicose veins, Pinterest might be the platform for you. Uh, obviously, women ages 25 to 55 are flocking to Pinterest, and that's a quickly growing population on that social media platform. That decision is just going to depend on what you and your practice want to do. Um, there's the YouTube channel. The, the Twitter page, this is a little bit old. At the time, there were about 1,000 followers. I think they're up close to 1,600 or 1,700 at this point uh, at Cincinnati Children's. Obviously, I've been gone now for over two years. Uh, this is their Facebook page. Also been very successful. Um, it's amazing on the Facebook page how often our ultrasound technologists will be doing an ultrasound on a patient, and uh, they'll be telling the parents uh, that we have a Facebook page. The parents will go to the Facebook page while their kid is getting the ultrasound, rape, rate Cincinnati Children's and leave a review. So there's all kinds of ways where this can pay off uh, that you may not expect. Uh, Instagram, um, Cincinnati Children's has done Instagram better than any other uh, department uh, in the United States and they didn't start this until after I left so I'm certainly not taking credit for anything here. Um, they, they have relied on Instagram for the education mission, the, the education portion of the social media mission uh, and they post daily and, and really have developed a remarkable archive of content for interventional radiology. I think Instagram and Vine could be just uh, incredible. There's an amazing potential between those two with how image-centric we are and video-centric we are. Uh, so lots of possibilities. Also, if people have heard of Figure One, it's a fairly new medical image social media sharing site. Uh, and Cincinnati Children's had the uh, first hospital account. They were invited by Figure One to be the first hospital account. So clearly uh, the, the effort is paying off at Cincinnati Children's and realize, again, this is about two and a half to three years in the making. Uh, this is not something that happened overnight. I'm going to show a brief video here um, just so you guys can see what these look like. Okay, so the video might be a little bit choppy, but just stick with me. My name is Dr. Dan Podoreski. I'm one of the pediatric body imagers here in the Department of Radiology at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. I will be explaining what an MR interrography is and what it entails. 
we perform over 200 MR enterographies a year here at Cincinnati Children's Hospital in children and young adults. And the main purpose of the study is to look for signs of inflammation as can be seen with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. The study gives us a very detailed look at the small and large intestine as well as all the other organs in the abdomen and pelvis that may be affected by inflammatory bowel disease and its complications. MR enterography involves the use of strong magnetic fields and radio frequency pulses to generate highly detailed imaging. The MR exam typically takes about 45 minutes, sometimes it can take up to 60 minutes. And during that time, the patient is asked to lay most of the time on their stomach, although sometimes on their back, and to follow breathing instructions, sometimes requiring holding of breath for 15 to 20 seconds at a time during the study. The patient can listen to music or watch a movie during the exam to make it more comfortable. The exam does involve drinking about a liter of oral contrast agent to distend the small intestine and improve our ability to detect areas of inflammation in the bowel. The study also involves placement of an IV line during which IV contrast will be given towards the end of the exam for post-contrast imaging, which also assists us in determining areas of actively inflamed bowel. Once the study is completed, the board-certified pediatric radiologist will read the exam typically within 30 to 60 minutes, and the report will be sent directly to the ordering doctor, and results will be available to be reviewed on my chart by the patient or the patient's parents. We are always available in the radiology department to answer questions. Our technologists are frequently available to answer most questions that patients have, but radiologists are also available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, to answer any questions that you may have about the MR enterography procedure. Okay, I know that video was probably choppy on the uh, other end of the go-to go -to meeting, but uh, I think you can understand that as a um, parent, if you have access to that, you clearly know what your kid is in for and feel much better coming into the department, again, forming those opinions that I was talking about, perhaps forming a positive opinion before showing up. Uh, rather than if that was not uh, made available. Um, so now let's talk briefly about how we measure return on investment. Because the first thing that anyone's going to say if you go to your hospital, your, your department chair, hospital leadership, and say you want to do this, is they're going to ask, what's the ROI? What's the return on investment? How is this going to help us? Uh, so really, there have been very few studies that have looked at this. The best work to date has taken place at Massachusetts General Hospital, and they did this in their mammography division. I'm going to go over what they found. Um, at Massachusetts General back in November 2014, uh, they started um, paying for Google Ads as well as Facebook Ads. And what you see on the, in November, they started Google Ads. And then Facebook, uh, in December, they started two different ads and carried one of those out through February. The point of these ads was then they could track them. They all had, uh, they had a, a link that was trackable so they could figure out how many phone calls and registrations and actual mammograms they were getting from their paid targeted ads on both Google and Facebook. Here's what the ads looked like. Uh, they, had, uh, they had ads that were made for mobile as well as for desktop on both Google and on Facebook. And they tracked these. So first of all, the Google and Facebook ads generated over 2.3 million impressions. Now, we don't really know what to do with impressions. Uh, that's really any... Um, that's the number of Twitter feeds that an ad showed up in or the number of times that it showed up on a Google page or the number of times it was shared on Facebook. If you add all of those up together in sum, that's what an impression is. We don't really know what that means, although we assume in the social media world that more impressions is better. And what they did is they geo-targeted women greater than 37 years of age that lived within a one-hour driving distance of their mammography imaging centers. Um, kind of creepy uh, how accurate and how targeted you can get with some of these Google and Facebook ads. If you're bored sometime, go ahead and check it out. Uh, just go to Google Ads. And um, I'm pretty sure Google and Facebook know everything about us, and we're just all in denial. But what they learned was out of all the visits to their scheduling page, they had a specific mammography scheduling page. It had a vanity name, and I don't remember right now, but I think it was mgh mammography or mymgh mammography.com or something. 
Uh, out of all the visits to that page, 6.2 thousand of those, or 77% of total traffic, came from these paid uh, paid ads through Google and Facebook. They got 50 phone calls to request mammograms. Um, you could schedule an appointment online as well, but they got 50 phone calls directly just from paying for these geotagged uh, ads. They have 525 new Facebook fans over the course of uh, this study. Um, there were 8,000 uh, total visitors to the scheduling page. Again, 80% uh, of those were from those paid geotags, uh, approximately 80%. Of the paid traffic that made it to the scheduling page, 81% was from Facebook and only 19% was from Google, which was interesting. Uh, of the unpaid traffic, 73% of the unpaid traffic was from Google uh, and 7% um, direct. So uh, hard to know what this means other than um, a lot of people probably go to Google um, and were searching for MGH mammography perhaps and, and that converted uh, to such a high uh, number of visitors from unpaid traffic from Google. Um, again, 54% of all of the traffic to the scheduling page came from mobile devices. Another important thing to keep in mind as you're thinking about a social media strategy, 62% uh, of paid traffic came from a mobile device, and only 30% of unpaid traffic came from a mobile device, which tells me that people that are visiting a scheduling page from unpaid ads are sitting down at their computer with intention uh, of actually searching for and perhaps making an appointment, in this case, mammography, uh, rather than if you're being geotagged and you just pull up Facebook on your mobile phone and you're 37 years old and a woman and live within an hour driving distance of MGH, you're going to get an ad popped up in your face. So uh, perhaps the unpaid desktop searchers were actually searching for mammography with intention. Uh, in sum, they had 8,000 visitors, 335 scheduling submissions came from their paid targeted ads, and they scheduled 300 exams, or really what that is is a 4% conversion. So of the 8,000 people that ended up coming to that page, 4% actually ended up making an appointment, which sounds like a small number, but again, if you're starting to calculate an ROI, and these paid geotags are amazingly inexpensive, uh, perhaps this is worth your time. A couple things they learned, um, they know that Facebook outperformed Google for traffic, so Facebook uh, probably has greater reach uh, than Google. Um, although, you know, we know that 90% of all Google clicks come on the first page, um, you know, there are other options when you Google, and so perhaps your tagged, uh, geotagged or geotargeted ad may not be the one that get clicked on, but Facebook will put an ad in everybody's feed that shows up right in front of their face. Um, but Google outperformed Facebook for conversions. So during the Google only month, nine they had a 9% conversion rate as only compared to only 2 to 5%. Uh, during the Facebook dominant month. So perhaps, again, if people are sitting down on their desktop and searching for something with intention, perhaps paying for those ads is going to lead to a higher conversion rate. We don't really know that. And really, what MGH has done is at least started the discussion on how we're going to measure return on investment because ultimately, you know, even if you take all of the tools that we laid out and all of the different examples of how different departments and different sections have implemented a social media program, unless we can really begin to start measuring what this is doing for our practice beyond just likes and retweets and favorites, uh, et cetera, uh, it's going to be a challenge for us as a profession to really begin to implement social media programs successfully, uh, as Rajat and I have talked about and hoped for. So with that, um, I, will, I would love to take any questions if any of you have them. And I thank you guys so much again for your time uh, that you spent here on a Sunday evening. Awesome, Dr. Hawkins, thanks so much for everything there. It was a lot of uh, rich, useful information, and I hope uh, the attendees here will be able to implement them at their department. Um, just, I mean, I have a quick question here. So, you know, when you talk about sustainability, and you were mentioning these different radiology departments, the number of radiologists, um, if we're talking about just the IR department, um, do you think it is sustainable from a standpoint of, of using just say trainees or medical students to run the social media platform and, it, and if we excluded the blog which can be very you know uh, time heavy in terms of an investment do you think it's sustainable for just trainees or students to to run it and then pass it down to future generations there my my hunch and it's nothing more than a hunch is if you want to do it from purely a 
um, showcase standpoint, like show some of the cool cases that you've done or perhaps highlight some of the research coming out of a section and just to make that information available on social networks. Yeah, I, I don't think you need a social media manager, um, but I think if you really want to start getting into um, reaching, targeting particular populations, actually practice management, growing a practice, uh, it's probably more important to also highlight beyond just what your interventional radiology department is doing. So you think about interventional oncology, for example, you think about how closely we work with our body imagers and our nuclear medicine physicians uh, and our, uh, you know, our oncologists and our surgical oncologists. There's a lot of other physicians that we work with that probably should be um, certainly highlighted or at least um, have some input on what this should look like uh, as you're targeting specific populations. So um, it probably depends on what the goals of a interventional radiology section are. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is a pretty crappy answer, I know, but it's the best I can do. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Um, so I guess, you know, with all these different platforms, uh, you know, which would you recommend for these attendees here to start with? Would you say Twitter or Facebook or, or um, Instagram or all three of them or yeah Twitter's the place to start Twitter's definitely the place to start so you get a feel for who's out there so like as you mentioned who are who are the big names if you're trying to figure out what other IR departments are doing on social media you start on Twitter uh, but then as you start thinking about building your your presence on Facebook still unfortunately has the broadest reach that is changing quickly um, I would be really quick to adopt Instagram these days as well uh, I think LinkedIn and Doximity are more for individual radiologists, less so for a department. Um, but uh, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube are probably going to be, at least in the near future, with Facebook, just something you have to do uh, because it is still just so, so big. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question here from uh, Dr. Vatican Cherry uh, from Kaiser in California. His question is, um, how can we rec how can we enhance the use of social media for recruitment of medical students to the new IR residency? Yeah, that's and that's something I think we've we've actually started to do do fairly well. So, number one is to have a pr constant presence, and I know I know the the RFS the Sir RFS is working on that. I think JVIR has done an excellent job improving their social media presence. Uh, those are things that trainees are going to look for. Uh, again, and part of that is making sure the material that's being posted by interventional radiologists has searchable, mineable hashtags. Um, so that way the material isn't just a blip on the radar. Um, as medical students begin looking for interventional radiology residencies, if they learn that IRAD, hashtag IRAD, is where they, what they can search to find interventional radiology specific content, reliably, um, you're going to begin to see uh, more people pay attention to what we're doing in IR, at least from a medical student standpoint. So um, I think consistent presence with reliable use of, of content and hashtags that make the information searchable. Great. And uh, again, if anybody has any more questions, uh, you can just go ahead and post it there to the question box and we'll uh, pass them right along to Dr. Hawkins here. Um, so in, in terms of the, the governance and the uh, content committee, um, again, kind of relaying back to the sustainability question, do you think that can be run on a sole basis um, from, uh, with just trainees and, and students? Or do you think that has to have all these different um, players involved, as you mentioned, the physicists and, and all these different... Um, the, the content committee, it's really helpful to, to get multiple viewpoints. And actually, I think you'll find that if you in, involve your technologists and nurses, et cetera, they, they really enjoy this part of it. You know, it kind of gives them a chance to brag about um, where they work. And I'll tell you, from an integration standpoint or from actually getting your presence out there on social media, there is no better way than getting your technologists involved because if you do a profile on one of them, they post it to their 400 or 500 friends. Um, people start to, um, at least in the local community, get a sense for what's happening uh, in, in your division. So 
um, I think they're important to have on the contact committee. From the governance standpoint, I, you know, you at least are going to have to have a physician liaison, someone involved with the healthcare uh, entity that you're working with. It'd be very difficult to to run a um, an, an operation that is compliant with all of the hospital regulations without some sort of physician presence. However, with all of that being said, I do think a social media presence can be uh, primarily run um, by trainees. It's certainly not something that has to have 100% uh, total physician oversight. I mean, I, we know that, I know that from personal experience. Sure. Um, so a question here is coming from Shafiq Wasaf. Uh, his question is, would you be friends with your patients on Facebook? No, 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 it's a great question. Everyone always asks about that. I, I don't think engaging with um, with your patients directly on um, social media sites is wise. The, the example that I showed you where the, the patient reached out directly, um, what I have done in the past um, with that instance and other instances is I will then engage them privately just through like a direct message on Twitter and I'll give them you know, my university email address, and then we take care of everything else through that. Um, I don't think engaging with patients, we're not there yet. I don't think, if something were to happen, I don't truly think healthcare entities are in a position where they know how to deal with those situations intelligently. And unfortunately, there have been a lot of knee-jerk reactions where employees have been fired uh, for um, engaging with patients or patient material, sometimes in very inappropriate and negligent ways, but sometimes, sadly, Sometimes maybe not. Mm -hmm. Great, uh, great thing to keep in mind there. Um, so you know, Dr. Hawkins, uh, the RFS here, we're trying to really uh, boost our own social media presence. I think the next step from this webinar is just kind of get an idea of everyone who attended and maybe make like a Google document and just kind of get everyone's email information on there and then kind of keep track of them along the way if or if not they've started up a platform. But uh, kind of touching back to Dr. Vatican Cherry's question is, you know, making IR more searchable or mineable in terms of hashtags or, or whatever from a medical student standpoint, um, what can you recommend, um, you know, the RFS do in terms to connect better with different IR departments out there and, and boost our presence as a whole um, with, with, with hopefully these new platforms that may be coming up at, in different places? You know, one, one aspect we didn't really talk much about is, is how do you, how do you actually go about engaging with people on social media networks? And um, one thing you want to be weary of is just using social media as a digital billboard and just posting things on Twitter, hoping people are going to, you know, drive down the social media interstate and see your post and love it and share it with people because that doesn't really happen. So the best way to start is with all of the different interest groups you guys have. I know you have different institutions that have medical student interest groups. Uh, engaging with those individuals and then encouraging them to become the liaisons because who they talk to individually as they talk to people individually about what's going on with the interventional radiology um, uh, residency and I don't mean physically talking to them but as they engage with individuals through social media that's going to be how the word spreads things don't things don't or rarely spread through social media networks virally um, virality is something that we make a big deal about, but it rarely, rarely, rarely happens. Um, having individual liaisons out there, speaking with their friends or other contacts or physician colleagues, that's how the word's going to spread. Sure. Okay, so um, I, I guess we'll start from there. You know, we'll get an idea of everybody who's attended here, and then we'll, we'll hopefully try to keep track of different platforms that may be popping up here and there along the way. And uh, Dr. Hawkins, just want to thank you again so much for your time and uh, you know taking out an hour of your Sunday evening to spend with us. And it was really great, rich, useful information. And um, oh, it looks like we do have another uh, question here from Evans Hythus. I'm going to go ahead and unmute him. Hey, Evans. Oh, sorry about that. That was an error. Uh, thank you for the excellent lecture. I think this was very useful information for us. Great. Thanks a lot, Evans. I appreciate that. Uh, and so does Dr. Hawkins, I'm sure. Uh, so yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, you know, keep track of uh, what different platforms are coming up here. And hopefully we can start uh, you know, boosting everyone's presence mutually as a society. I guess that would be a long-term goal. And um, we'll keep you uh, 
informed of, of how things are going and hopefully we can have you back at some point along the way as well. All right. Well, I thank you very much, Rajat. I uh, appreciate you inviting me to do this. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Uh, oh, wait. We do have one more question here. <laughs> um, this question comes, sorry, from Janice Newsom. She <laughs> asked, uh, are you obtaining separate consent for, uh, from patients to use pictures? Hey, Janice. Uh, yeah, we did. So anytime we had a patient that had a particularly good experience, we did have a, it was like a sort of a multimedia consent. So it was good for pictures, uh, quotes, uh, as well as video. It was a universal consent. We did not, though, do that for every patient. Um, I would say that in interventional radiology, it probably, if you had a really robust program, it probably behoove you to just go ahead and get that consent on every patient. Um, uh, it's different than a diagnostic radiology where you're running tons of patients through the CT scanner or through the radiography department. Okay, great. Uh, sorry for mispronouncing your name there, Janice. Um, That's all right. Jan Jan Janice and I work together. I think it's funny. That... Okay. <laughs> good, good to have her on here. <laughs> great. Well, I, I think that wraps it up there. Uh, again, thanks a lot. And uh, this will be available on YouTube. If you just uh, search IR Education, you can get the content all over again. And um, Have a great night, everybody. Thanks for coming out. All right. Good night. Good night.